we are very happy to have Dr. Ian Miller with us uh, tonight to talk about the Elwha Nearshore 10 years after the dam was removed. Um, Ian uh, is a coastal hazard specialist in the Olympic Peninsula. Um, he has a bunch of different expertise, including sea level rise, coastal flooding, marine debris, tsunamis, beach erosion, other changes, Washington coastal ecology, coastal sediment transport, and geomorphology. Uh, he's a skilled science communicator and media spokesperson, as well as a trained scientist. Um, he works out in uh, Port Angeles, uh, working out of Peninsula College, and he works with coastal communities and public agencies on the peninsula to strengthen their ability to plan for and manage coastal hazards, including tsunamis, chronic erosion, coastal flooding, and other hazards associated with climate change. We got to have some talk at some point this year on climate change. It's just maybe Ian will touch on it some tonight, without a doubt. Um, Ian led the development of uh, Washington State's most recent sea level rise assessment and has also partnered in the development of comprehensive climate change vulnerability assessments for the Jamestown Sklalem tribe and communities on the North Olympic Peninsula. He's an author on 16 publications focused on the Elwha Dam removal, which we'll be speaking about tonight. He has advised the Puget Sound Pilots and U.S. Coast Guard Air Station Sector Field Office, Port Angeles, both based on Edith's Hook on tsunami hazards and evacuation strategies. Before joining Washington Sea Grant, Ian served as the education director of the Olympic Park Institute and as Washington field coordinator for the nonprofit Surfrider Foundation. And he is an avid surfer and scuba diver himself. He holds a bachelor's degree in marine ecology from Western Washington University's Huxley College of Environmental Studies and a PhD in ocean sciences from the University of California, Santa Cruz. That makes you a banana slug, doesn't it? I, I suppose so, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> His graduate research focused on the transport and fate of sediment in the coastal zone adjacent to the Elwha Delta. So this guy knows a lot about the Elwha. And you can also check him out at the Coast Nerd Gazette blog. Uh, doing a lot of great stuff and can't wait to hear what he has to tell us tonight about the Elwha. I'll hand it over to Ian right now. Oh, Thank you, yeah. uh, Woody. Yeah, so I will uh, fire up my slides if you give me. There you go. Already. Okay, hopefully. Does that seem like it's working okay? All right, great. Well, thanks, everybody. That was a long introduction. Um, and uh, a little embarrassing, actually. I was getting some heckling texts from some friends that are that are on the uh, presentation right now. Hello, Chrissy and Kevin, um, and good to see everybody else. Thanks for joining. Um, and um, I'm going to dive right in. And the focus here was on um, you know that, trying to provide some insight about uh, the Elwha ten years after dam removal started, um, just almost just a month over ten years ago. So. We're really falling on that anniversary. Um, before I do so, I'll note, um, I do have a, some slides for you to, to, to look at. Hopefully everyone's able to see them okay. I'm gonna try to remember to walk everyone through uh, what's on there as well as possible. I am a, a, a science nerd, so there, there are some data figures and um, hopefully I'll walk them through well enough so that you can um, understand them. There's also some videos in here and I'm a little nervous about um, everything coming through okay, so hopefully that works out. And Woody, I've got my um, phone open here, so just if anything's not looking right, you can certainly let me know. Um, the Elwha was really distinct. The Elwha project, the restoration, the dam removal, and all the sort of studies associated with it were really distinctive, if for me at least, if only because of just the number of people engaged um, from all sorts of different um, in scientific institutions and, and citizen scientists and students and um, most of them who were engaged sort of associated with their own passion. They were driving it somehow. Um, they weren't told to be there by anybody. So there's a whole list of people on this slide and many of these names will come up on the slides to follow. Um, it's worth noting that I sent Woody a, uh, so I've got a number of citations in here that if anyone really wants to dive in further with anything I talk about, um, I sent Woody a list of um, references. 
most of which are open access publications. So they're not behind a paywall, easily accessed. And so I think Woody was going to uh, include that in the chat for anyone that wants to uh, follow up. Okay, so hopefully I can advance. All right, so uh, just a little geographic placement, just in case I think people sounds like people are calling in from all over the place and probably all over the Northwest. But the Elwha River is a relatively small river from a global standpoint, but it is one of the bigger rivers on the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, which is, uh, you know, the peninsula west of Puget Sound. Uh, and the Elwha drains the central Olympic mountains to the north, so it drains into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And, uh, you know, we're talking about the removal of these two dams on the river. Their locations are marked with these red bars on the map. Um, one of them was at River Mile 5, and the other, the upper um, dam, I think was R River Mile 13, if I recall correctly. These are photographs of what the dams used to look like. They now look very different because um, they are removed. And the, uh, this is the lower Elwha Dam and the upper Glines Canyon Dam. And I've titled this slide the Elwha Laboratory only to emphasize that the removal of these dams was, um, in, in a lot of ways, at least from the standpoint of landscape response, uh, was an experiment. It was something that had, hadn't been tried before at this scale. And so we didn't necessarily know what to expect leading up to it. So I really view it as, um, as experimental in nature. And um, I wanted to hone in in particular, oops, sorry, I'm already having some, come on. I wanted to hone in in particular on what we refer to as the L1 near shore or littoral zone. There we go. Okay, can you all see this uh, map of the shoreline, the Elwha shoreline? Give me a nod, Woody, if that's what you see. Okay, sorry. Um, all right, so I uh, just in terms of a bit more geography, I focus on the coastal environment or the coastal zone around the Elwha uh, pretty exclusively. So there was a whole group of people focusing on the river, um, the physical and ecological effects in the river, um, I and the people that I tended to work with largely focused on the coastal environment. So this is a map to sort of help you um, connect to some place names that I may use. Um, so this is the river mouth right here. Hopefully you can see my mouth or my, my, my mouse um, labeled the river mouth. And then to the west of that is Freshwater Bay, this kind of embayment uh, just to the west of the river mouth. And then I'll refer to the Elwha Delta at times, which is this uh, delta-shaped landform that sticks out into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And then the Elwha Bluffs are to the east of the river mouth. That's a bluff-backed section of shoreline about five miles long or so. And then finally, Eddie's Hook is this uh, roughly uh, four to five mile long, um, used to be a uh, sand and gravel spit. It's now fairly heavily developed, has a road on it, riprap. Um, Coast Guard base, and that's referred to as Eddie's Hook. And then, um, you know, for coastal con context, the energy movement through the Strait of Juan de Fuca is largely west to east. So following the direction of this red arrow, and in particular for some of what I'm going to talk about, this concept of literal drift or that westward dominated energy associated with wind and waves, um, pushing sediment from the west in this system to the east. That's our dominant direction of sediment transport that we expect based on the energy traveling through the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Okay, so this is the first of a couple of videos. So hopefully you're seeing this. It's a time lapse of the removal of the lower of the two dams. Um, the uh, Aldwell Dam, and this again started in uh, September of 2011. So we're just over 10 years from when that began. And the questions that we framed for the dam removal is how will dam removal change the near shore, both physically and ecologically? Um, and if so, how quickly? And are those changes persistent? And, you know, it's worth noting here that we're talking about a dam five miles up a river. 
And um, so it's worth asking, what's the mechanism? What is the process by which we might expect a dam removal to lead to changes in the coastal environment, both physical and ecological? And that uh, mechanism or process, oh gosh. There we go. That mechanism or process by which we can drive change, uh, you know, associated with the dam removal in the coastal zone is sediment stored in reservoirs. And so this is a photograph, aerial photograph looking downriver. So this is looking to the north um, fr uh, fr from an airplane, obviously. And this is looking sort of downriver along what used to be the Aldwell, or the, the reservoir backed up behind the Elwha Dam, referred to as Lake Aldwell. And this particular photo was shot in early 2011, so before dam removal had started, but um, at, just after the reservoirs were sort of drawn down a few feet. And what you can see here is this delta in this lake, which is stored sediment, 100 years of stored sediment backed up uh, uh, in association with the construction of that dam. And it's that sediment that is the mechanism um, that leads to coastal change associated with dam removal. And so what we expected to see was the movement of that sediment from the two reservoirs into the coastal environment. Um, we didn't have a clear sense for how much and how quickly that would move, but indeed that movement is exactly what happened. And to try to sort of convey um, kind of the details of that movement. I'm going to use this sediment budget, which you uh, see on your screen here. So this is essentially a map view of the Elwha. Here's again, for example, Eddie Sook. And then we've got this big brown arrow, which represents the, the flux or movement of sediment in terms of mass. The unit here is uh, millions of metric tons of sediment. And the thickness of the arrow gets at sort of a relative amount. Uh, and so this kind of conveys where sediment came from during the five years of dam removal. This covers uh, basically the fall of 2011 to the fall of 2016. Um, so the thickness of the arrow gets at, gets at sort of the relative proportions of, of sources and sinks of that sediment over that five-year time period. So to focus on the biggest components of the arrow, here's erosion of Lake Mills, uh, roughly 16.1 million metric tons. Here's erosion of Lake Aldwell. So those two reservoirs, 3.2 million metric tons. Those are the biggest sources. But you'll also note here that there's a uh, quick, or not quick, but uh, most of that material moved into the coastal environment. And so I'm gonna emphasize just a couple things here. So 65%, of the 30 million metric tons that was trapped in the two reservoirs mobilized in this five-year time period. So 65% of the total that was in those two reservoirs. Most of that was rapidly transferred to the coast with the exception, you'll notice these little sort of arrows that spur off and the green here um, represents sinks of sediment. So places where it end up. So you see there's a small fraction um, that ended up actually is in the river or in the floodplain. Some of it is still there, but most of it went to the coastal zone. And then these kind of bar plots over here are a time series of when these, uh, when those movement happens. And you'll notice the, you'll notice that these biggest bars are in this 2013 water year. So calendar year, that's 2013 into 2014. Um, and that is when most of this sediment movement happened. So uh, uh, most of it moved to the coast and it happened quickly in that 2013 to 2014 time period. And during that time period, the, 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 the way I like to talk about it is the Elwha River was moving so much sediment that it was essentially acting like the Skagit River, which is a much larger river, the biggest river emptying into Puget Sound. Um, the other uh, sort of way to conceptualize these masses is this amount of movement is equivalent to a dump truck backing up to the mouth of the Elwha River every minute of every daylight hour 
over these over this five year time period and dumping a load of sediment. So that is kind of the work that the river was doing, transferring this hundred years of stored sediment, a mix of mud, uh, sand and gravel down into the Strait of Juan de Fuca very rapidly. So just to put some images to the consequences of that, um, one of them was that especially in that 2013 to 2014 time period, the, um, the Strait of Juan de Fuca uh, was characterized by a fairly turbid plume uh, that was coming out of the Elwha. So this is a photograph looking upriver um, this is the Elwha River mouth right here, and you see this very obvious turbid plume. So this is fine sediment primarily carried in suspension in the water that is, um, that is uh, sort of um, basically making the coastal waters very turbid or muddy in that time period. The coarser sediment that was carried by the river created new estuarine and freshwater marsh habitats, especially right down by the river mouth. So this is an aerial photograph of the Elwha River mouth taken in 2009. And then this is a fairly recent aerial photograph, the same exact um, uh, location and coverage of the photo taken in 2018. And you see this extensive new uh, kind of marsh and estuarine habitat that's been created mostly by the deposition of sand and gravel uh, right near the river mouth. Now, some of that material, some of that sand and gravel in particular, was entrained into the, the beach transport system and moved along shore uh, to the east towards Eddie's Hook. And so this, for example, is a set of photographs. This one taken in July 2013. This is a site about, oh, a little shy of a mile east of the Elwha River mouth. So here's July 2013, and then the same site in June of 2018. And hopefully you can see uh, this transition, clear transition from a fairly coarse, cobbly, or even bouldery uh, beach into a very sandy beach in this time period. And then oh gosh. Sorry about that. Some of that material has made it all the way at this point to Eddie's Hook, which is uh, over six miles away. Um, so this is a photograph taken up the beach at Eddie's Hook. Again, this, uh, this is a, a former sand spit that used to, that forms uh, Port Angeles Harbor. Um, and this is a photograph taken looking up the shoreline of Eddie's Hook. Again, there's this riprap that was placed in the 70s as an Army Corps erosion control project. And then a very coarse beach substrate. And this is that same exact location shot in 2018. Now we're not talking about an enormous volume of sediment making it this far, but enough to change the composition of the shoreline here from obviously very coarse to a somewhat finer beach surface. And then some of that material ended up on the seafloor. Um, so this particular map is an elevation change map uh, where the scale down here is, uh, gets at vertical change in the surface. It's in meters. So the hot colors are five meters or five meters plus. So over 15 or 16 feet of vertical change. And you'll notice here the deep red, that is that river mouth kind of estuarine habitat that I showed you an aerial photo of. But these two arrows mark these two deposits of subtidal deposition. These are places where the seafloor essentially changed because uh, sand or mud was laid down on the seafloor. Now, if you pay attention to the scale, these tend to be fairly thin deposits on the order of maybe a foot or two. But as you'll see, hopefully if these videos play okay on your end if we focus in on a site um, just to the east of the river mouth where this yellow star is located um, that site has transitioned from being a fairly cobbly kelpie site to essentially a pure sand site 
I'm a little worried about the videos, but I'm just going to press forward. Um, okay. And, and if you couldn't see that, you'll just have to take my word for it. Um, so that's kind of a summary of some of the physical transitions that occurred in the nearshore in this uh, you know, shallow subtidal and intertidal environment um, in the coastal zone. So I want to turn now to asking the question, do these physical changes result in ecological change? And in particular, I'm going to focus on this shallow subtitle, these shallow subtitle habitats um, sort of pointed to with this arrow in this kind of classic Puget Sound, uh, Salish Sea nearshore environment schematic. Um, and these are these um, uh, zones that would be within the sunlit zone. So fairly shallow, less than 100 feet, characterized by uh, seaweeds, um, uh, kelp, for example. Um, so that's kind of the, the, that was the focus of an investigation that I'm going to describe to you. And that's also sort of characterizes the delta out in front of the Elwha. It tends to be, there's a broad, relatively shallow platform out there. Um, and our hypothesis going into this was that we would expect to see ecological change in that, in those habitats driven by physical change. And the physical changes in particular that we expected were from a pre-removal environment that was characterized by fairly clear water um, and then a relatively coarse substrate. And again, that video that I showed you just previously didn't, uh, I don't know if people were able to see, but you know, generally the Elwha seafloor was characterized by a lot of cobble. And so cobbly seafloor, fairly clear water before dam removal. During dam removal, we have turbid water associated with that fine sediment that the river was eroding out of the reservoirs. And then in a second phase, deposition on the seafloor of finer material. And then in our post-removal um, phase, we, we again have clear water as that turbidity from, dam as from the dam removal, peak of dam removal clears up, but we're, we are, we're left with a finer seafloor. And the combination of that turbid water column during dam removal and then a finer seafloor after dam removal were expected to drive uh, significant ecological change in terms of the marine community, in terms of what could live in these habitats. So deposition and turbidity. So to test what sorts of ecological changes we, we uh, would see in response to dam removal, we decided to utilize scuba-based approaches um, and put together what we call the Elwha Interagency Dive Team. It's a dive team that um, is led by the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, people working primarily out of their Seattle office. Uh, and then we've got divers from the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe, and then myself from the University of Washington, Washington Sea Grant. And then we also occasionally had participation from um, the dive team uh, from EPA Region 10, so their office in Seattle. And the methods that we utilized to try to get at the uh, ecosystem changes associated with dam removal were to establish, establish a series of what we refer to as fixed sites uh, across the system. Now, up at the upper right of this slide, there's a map. Uh, we can see, hopefully, make out the Elwha Delta in here, Eddie's Hook. And then each of these blue dots is a site. Um, you'll also note we established two control sites outside of the Elwha. These are um, happen to be off of um, Seabert Creek, more towards Dungeness Spit for those of you that are familiar with the strait, um, but an area that's outside the zone of influence of um, the uh, Elwha dam removals. And then each of these sites is characterized by a 100 meter long transect that runs through a post. We just put a metal post on the seafloor. They're temporary. It's just sort of sitting on a disc of metal, kind of like an anchor. And then 50 meters east and west of that post are cement blocks that mark the end of our transect. And basically, every time we revisit these sites, divers go to the center post. There's four divers. 
Um, two go east, two go west. And our main focus is on a 30 meter long transect that kind of sits in the middle of these two markers. And what we're doing along that 30 meter transect is something we refer to as a swath survey. Basically, we've got a transect line stretched between our center post and that, that cement block at the end. And we have a, a meter on either side of that line along which we're measuring uh, and counting, counting and identifying invertebrates, uh, algae, seaweeds, and then uh, fish, benthic fishes in particular, and then also characteristics of the seafloor, um, things having to do with um, uh, grain sizes, uh, what's uh, directly attached to grains in some cases. And we're marking that on a data sheet as we cruise along this transect. And the primary thing that we're getting out of that uh, those data are densities. So since we have a swath that we're measuring, in our case, it's 30 meters long by a meter wide. So we've got a known area. And then we have a count within that swath. So we can easily convert that into a density. That's the primary sort of uh, currency, if you will, of our study. And that's primarily what I'm going to show you um, tonight. So before we start, um, I'm going to, I want to wanted to have you come underwater with us. I'm again going to do that using video, so hopefully this uh, works out. But uh, just to give you a, a sense for our dive team there. And um, I'm first, so I'm going to show you um, just to, again to give you a sense for what this looks like when we're underwater. Uh, I'm going to take you to this site. We refer to it as H2 just because we're horrible at naming things. It's uh, where this yellow star is. So here's the Elwha River mouth. It's roughly about a mile east of the river mouth and in about 35 feet of water. And so I'm going to start this video, which hopefully plays. Man, struggling. Maybe I'm not going to start this video. Okay, at the risk of, let's just try, I'm gonna shut my video off to see if that helps at all. Okay, hopefully that's coming through for everybody. So the key things here, you can see our tape, which marks our transect. All right, I got a thumbs up. So hopefully everyone's able to see that. And hopefully no one gets seasick from watching this. Um, so you can see the tape there that marks our transect. And this is from this summer. So this is 2021 survey. And you'll get a sense for what the seafloor looks like. It's fairly cobbly at this site. Relatively good growing site for especially seaweeds. Typically with this, um, with this video view, you don't see a lot of the inverts that are present at this site. But you do get a sense for uh, especially kelp and algae densities. OK. And then just by way of comparison, I'm going to take you to the same site, um, but this is 2014. So right in the sort of middle or peak of that dam removal period, again, data sheet. And then you'll have the same perspective of a transect tape. And again, this is the same exact swath of seafloor. And so hopefully um, you can see an obvious difference here, not so much in the substrate itself, but in the growth of in particular kelps. And I am gonna focus first on the kelp story from the Elwha because it was definitely the most dramatic story. I think both, um, uh, during and after dam removal. It's the one that uh, uh, where we see the biggest effect essentially of dam removal. And um, in this system, there are nine species that are the dominant species. So there's photos shown here of those, many that many of you probably know well or see frequently um, when you're on the shoreline or, or snorkeling or diving. And I'm going to come back to this particular perspective on kelps a number of times. So 
th this is going to be a bar plot, although right now I'm only showing you one bar. And so down at the bottom, there is um, year from 2011 through 2020. And then on the y axis is density of kelps in uh, essentially kelps per meter squared. Um, so again, this is our density measure. That's our main kind of unit, unit of measurement for understanding the community effects. And then up above, I've got pre, during, and after dam removal marked out on there. So just to note, before dam removal, um, we have a fairly high density. Oh, and these are averaged across all 15 LWAS sites. So if you recall on that map, we had 15 sites scattered around the LWAS. This is an average of all of them. So first of all, it's a pretty kelpy place. Um, and when I say kelp here, I'm using the general term for all those species, not just bull kelp. Um, so our density here on the order of five per meter squared. So very uh, dense kelpy environment. I showed you that previous video. Here's another one just to kind of bring that point home. This is good growing ground for kelps. A generally coarse seafloor, shallow enough that there's plenty of light reaching the seafloor um, with you know lots of large material that kelps can grow on. So this is good kelp growing ground. And again, this is pre-dam removal. Now, if I pull that box back to show you the pattern during dam removal, we see these massive declines where kelp density declines by 80% or more during the dam removal years. So 2012, 13, and 14, massive declines. So what's going on here? Well, I'm guessing that many of you have already sort of uh, at least put together part of the story. But if you recall back to that, um, that turbid river mouth picture I show you, showed you, 2013 and 14 were characterized by just a lot of turbidity in the water column. This particular video that I'm showing, it's, it's a video, although it may just look like a black screen from where you're sitting. Um, but that video was shot during that 2014 time period in 22 feet of water. And it was absolutely black. I'm gonna try to, um, Go back to that because my screen with these videos is doing funny things. But the point being that um, our primary culprit here is reduced light during dam removal associated with turbidity. And there was a reference on that slide that I wanted to draw your attention to. Um, and that was a paper by Hannah Glover. It's one that I included a link for in the material that Woody has. Um, and Hannah is a student at the University of Washington who uh, really did some nice work showing that for most of the dam removal period 2013 to 14, um, if you if we we didn't really do a good job of measuring light on the seafloor, it's a hard thing to do. But she was able to model see, um, light on the seafloor and show that for most of dam removal, there wasn't enough to satisfy the light requirements for most algae species. And then the other thing was going that was going on was again. There was a different seafloor in places. So there was a limited number of sites, and I've circled them in the maps that are shown here on your screen, where the seafloor transitioned from being fairly coarse, providing cobble and boulder that kelps could attach to, to being very fine. So sandy, muddy in some cases, that uh, provides inadequate attachment for kelps. So that's the other factor, although I'd note that it was at a fairly limited number of sites right near the river mouth. So again, our hypothesis, we had sort of expected to see this on a much broader scale. And really, it only occurred right there, right near the river mouth. Okay. So after dam removal ended, so really around 2015, um, we saw that turbidity problem, if you want to refer to it as a problem, um, pretty much go away. Water cleared up. Um, and as a consequence, we start to see kelp recovery. Um, so this is, again, referring back to that bar plot. And this arrow marks out this recovery trajectory, where year over year, we see increasing density of kelps at our sites. Um, however, the, we don't see full recovery in the sense that we don't see these densities return 
to pre-dam removal densities, even though we're getting plenty of light on the seafloor at this stage. Um, most of the turbidity is gone. The river is no longer pumping out a massive amount of especially fine sediment. And we still don't have full recovery. And if we go to our control site, so if you recall back to that map, I sort of said, hey, we had these two control sites that are outside the Elwha. They were there specifically for, to our, uh, for us to be able to assess regional things happening in this system that might influence these species outside of dam removal. And if we look at those same years, 2014 to 15 to 16, we see, um, again, at our control sites, decline year over year in that time period. So this suggests that in that time period when we might expect to see more full recovery of kelps uh, at Elwha, there was something else happening, maybe something else suppressing kelp. And we have two hypotheses about what was going on at that time period. And the first one is something that I'm guessing many of you are familiar with and, and have heard about, sea star wasting syndrome. There should be an E on there, um, which really hit uh, Elwha in 2014. And these photographs that I have on the screen here are wasted or recently wasted sea stars. Sea stars in the process of dying in some cases, these were taken at our dive sites at Elwha. So we saw this disease hit hard. Um, and from the standpoint of kelps, the connection that's of particular importance here is the uh, influence of sea stars as predators on uh, kelpivores, things that eat kelp. And at Elwha, there's really two categories of kelpivores. We see urchins and we see kelp crabs. Um, this particular slide that I'm showing here is courtesy of a Friday Harbor Lab student, student Nick Smith, who used our data set to investigate the potential relationship between the density of urchins, one of our major groups of kelpivores, at our sites relative to the density of predatory sea star species. So species of sea stars, especially Pycnopodia, uh, the sunflower star that preys heavily on urchins. And uh, the, uh, Nick's results suggest that um, associated with the major decline in the density of predatory sea stars, urchins seem to respond favorably, which makes a ton of sense. You remove a predator, you get a positive response in the prey. And this probably then had a knock-on effect of adding um, grazing pressure on kelps in the system. The other big thing going on at this time period was the blob, which again, I'm guessing many of you are familiar with, uh, a zone of uh, anomalously high temperature in the Pacific that did make its way into Salish Sea um, in two, that late 2014 and 2015 and that has been shown to suppress kelp growth in other parts of the West Coast. And so that may have also played a role in suppressing kelp re uh, recovery at uh, Elwha. So we think that even though we were seeing recovery, it wasn't uh, as, as fast as it would have been absent of those two pressures. So now to show you the full time series based on our most recent data, uh, not including this summer's data, which is not, uh, uh, which we haven't worked up yet. You know, are we seeing something closer to full recovery? And it appears that we are possibly suppressed a little bit because we still have those couple of sites where the seafloor transitioned from being cobbly to fine. And we just don't see kelp uh, reemerging at those sites because there's no place for them to attach uh, in most cases. Okay. So let's quickly turn our attention away from kelp to invertebrates. Um, and there's a, a, a slide here just to give you a sense for the invertebrates that we see um, at, the, at these sites at the Elwha, many that you'll probably recognize and be familiar with. We see a variety of genera, large diversity of invertebrates. And largely we walked into the study thinking that we would see in the invertebrate community follow the kelp community in some way, shape, or form. Again, kelp are very common here. So we thought that the invertebrate community would probably be sort of attached in some way ecologically to kelp so that when they declined, um, these invertebrates would decline as well. 
but that was not the case. Um, and what I'm hopefully you can make out what I'm going to show you here because uh, this is kind of unfortunately pretty small. But what we have here is again density uh, in this upper right hand plot. And here I'm just showing you pre dam removal and then the first three years sort of during dam removal. So we have invertebrate density. This is broken out by area. So the gray line is west of the river mouth. The blue line is right at the river mouth. The brown line is east of the river mouth. And then the green is our control sites away from the Elwha. Um, and then the other plot is the number of taxa. So the number of species that we see on average um, at these sites. And the key takeaway here is just largely, at least in comparison to that kelp pattern, these invertebrate lines are fairly flat, right? Our takeaway here was that as a group, invertebrates, um, I'm going to frame it as didn't care about dam removal, although that's certainly not true. There were certainly winners and losers, but overall we're able, able to maintain a community through this um, dam removal period. And again, there were winners and losers. So the density and the number of taxa just provides you with a community scale perspective. And there were certainly species like here up on the screen is a picture of uh, stock jellies. There are very sort of kelp or algae dependent species. Um, we have kelp encrusting bryozoan. Those sorts of those invertebrates um, were largely absent from the system during dam removal. When kelp went away, they went away as well. But then by contrast, we have species like uh, the feather duster worm, Udistilia vancouveri, and um, there's a picture of it here. These are a large, robust um, tube worm, a filter feeder, sort of build a parchment tube out of the seafloor. And um, those had a very different response. So again, this particular bar plot is showing you density of these worms in particular at uh, Elwha sites. In this case, it's just averaging across the four sites to the west of the river mouth versus the control sites in red. Again, the control sites outside of the Elwha. And you'll see here that at our control sites, this species declined. At Elwha, they did really well. So this is a winner during dam removal. And in fact, we hypothesize that filter feeders in general might have been a winner um, through dam removal, we kind of said, hey, maybe they were responding like this because they were finding more food in the water. As all this material came down river, maybe all the organics that were in the reservoirs were a food source for filter feeders. But just to sort of support that notion that um, the invertebrate community kind of didn't care, uh, another student at Friday Harbor Labs that I worked with last year analyzed our data, focusing on filter feeders as a group. So two worms, um, clams are the two big ones, five valves that we see in the system. And actually she, Celine Tang, found that um, through time filter feeder densities, they varied, but not in response to sediment loads as far as we could tell. So in this case, the red line is sediment load through before, during and after dam removal. And then the green lines are the average density of filter feeders at Elwha. So even though those two worms seem to respond favor favorably, this suggests that maybe it wasn't because there was a bunch of extra food. There was something else going on with those two worms that we still don't fully understand. And then ending with fish, the fish story is even less clear, if only because we don't see fishes in the densities that we see um, invertebrates in. Diving isn't a great way to study and count fishes, um, but largely the story is the same for fish. Kind of, they did uh, sort of persisted fairly well through dam removal, again, with winners and losers. So kelp dependent uh, fish species like those that are shown up on this screen largely disappeared during dam removal, but then um, there were others that did quite well through dam removal. And hopefully you can make out this video because it's one of my favorites. This is one of those sites where we had deposition of sand on a formerly cobbly seafloor and what very rapidly moved into that sand and started utilizing it were sand lamps, which hopefully you can sort of make out darting in and out of this sandy substrate. One of the really sort of um, 
uh, impressive and hopeful stories in my mind of dam removal, at least under the surface of the ocean, were these sand lance moving into these um, new sediment, sedimentary environments very rapidly and using them in great numbers. So I'm going to end there. Thank you. Um, just to emphasize, you know, the dam removal changed the physical structure of the L1 nearshore, and it's still different in places. Those places where uh, sand and mud deposited on the seafloor, they're largely still that way. Um, ecological communities also responded, though some of those changes weren't persistent, right? Kelp um, it had, it did and is still recovering from dam removal. Um, and then also for things like invertebrates are muddled due to other perturbations that happen in the system. So disease, climate associated with the blob. Um, and then a little there about kelp and invertebrates seeming to, or invertebrates and fish seeming to shrug off, shrug off dam removal is the way I'll characterize it. Um, though there were winners and losers within those broad groupings. So um, thank you and happy to take any questions or discuss anything. And I, at the risk of causing problems, I'm going to turn my video back on. All right. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, everybody yes, can I will see certainly do so. all of our faces. Um, and if anybody has a question, you can go ahead and either raise your hand and unmute yourself, or you can put it in the chat and we can read it out. Sheila Byers. Hi, Ian. Great presentation. Very interesting. Thank I'm you. Uh, curious about, well, I guess curious as to what you're thinking in terms of the sand lance, given how much of a um, food source they are for uh, diving birds. Um, oh, my goodness. Lots of things. Yes. So I would think that would be a great success story. And that's yeah. Sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we were excited to see them move in. Um, anecdotally, we do think that the, the, you know, the presence of sand lance drove changes in the abundance of birds around the Elwha, for example, mm -hmm. um, and also marine mammals, although that's all anecdotal. Um, no one was really out there characterizing and counting things like birds and marine mammal usage in the system. So there's nothing we can really point to um, with a lot of rigor. But Certainly, it looks like, you know, this kind of um, uh, logic chain, I guess, of that sediment being laid down on the seafloor, um, sand lands very rapidly moving in to utilize it, and then predators responding definitely happened uh, around the Elwha. Now, what we can't say and what, uh, you know, what is still, I guess, a question in our mind is, does that new habit habitat represent new biomass of, sand, of, of forage, of these forage fish like sand lance. Like if we lay this material down on the seafloor and get sand lance moving in, are they moving in from somewhere else or are they actually sort of like, you know, expanding their population if they will? And that's not clear to us. Um, the other thing that we saw moving into those sandy seafloor environments, those new sandy seafloor environments were Dungeness crab, which is also something that we, you know, we tend to like to see um, and the commercial crabbers very quickly figured it out and started, um, you know, pursuing the crab into those sandy habitats. But that's also a case where we don't know if that represents new kind of production of crab or whether they're moving in from other locations and utilizing this kind of improved habitat. Could you also consider that as larval transport? I mean, that's kind of moving in from elsewhere, but nonetheless, it. Uh, just the fact that the plankton are mobile and all of a sudden now there's a very attractive uh, habitat to land on. Yes, possibly. Yeah. And yeah, and that's unclear. Again, no one was sort of like, for at least for the, the dam removal project, you know, no one took on tracking larval, um, yeah. um, the, the larval uh, planktonic community right. um, through dam removal. Right, right, very interesting. One more question, if I may. Uh, the um, sea star wasting disease, did you see any recovery thereafter? I may have missed that. Uh, well, yeah, I didn't really address that. And um, it's, it's still not totally clear. Um, we think that, well, 
I mean, I presented the data that Nick Smith worked up that suggested, at least for the predatory sea stars, Pycnopodia in particular, that in terms of the density of sea stars, we haven't yet seen recovery. Yeah. Um, now, interestingly, at Elwha, we never saw extir extirpation, right? Um, so there are some locations where they've disappeared. And we have seen Pycnopodia, and I think every species on our list, every single year, but nowhere near at the densities that we used to see them. Mm. Um, and the other thing that we noted, and we don't measure the sizes of the organisms that we count. Um, that's a real limitation of our data set. And the other thing that we've noted, and this has been noted elsewhere, that where you do see sunflower stars, they tend to be small. Um, so whereas in, you know, before sea star wasting disease, we wouldn't at all be surprised to see a, a Pycnopodia that was two feet, two feet across, you know, from arm to arm. And now uh, we get excited if we see something that's bigger than say eight or nine inches. Mm -hmm. um, now, that being said, this summer, we did note that we were seeing what we felt were, were some larger specimens. Mm -hmm. um, so that is maybe a sign of recovery, mm -hmm. but you know, it's worth noting that we also don't see that many of them. So maybe it was just random chance that the big ones were sort of lurking around our sites this summer. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to say. So definitely mixed in terms of, um, you know, the, the degree to which we feel like we're seeing recovery, but heartening that at least at these sites in the Elwha, um, you know, we, we still see them. Right, right. And that's, that's a good sign. Something yeah. is surviving. I yeah. think so. Yeah, I've always, I've always been, especially hearing stories from elsewhere, um, other locations in Puget Sound, other locations around um, on the West Coast where you know, things like picnic podia, people just don't see anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So there's at least a, a little refuge uh, around the Elwha for uh, picnic podia. Yeah, awesome, wonderful, thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, we do have a question in the chat, Ian. It says, given the significant impact of the sediment, would you recommend a different or a slower phased removal on other dams? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think that was kind of one of the things that was being tossed around before dam removal started. Um, and in fact, the Elwha was a, a phased process. Um, you know, the drawdown of the reservoirs took probably, I think, in total two years. Um, so it was a, a slower removal. And the point of comparison would be something like the, um, um, oh, I'm spacing on the name, the white uh, it was a dam removal that happened right around the same time as the Elwha that was on a tributary of the Columbia. And white, I'm white salmon. Th right? Thank you. The white salmon. Mm -hmm. That was what they call a blow and go dam removal. Yeah, so like, just blow it, out. blow it up and you're done. Um, so that's sort of an end member. Um, so Elwha was phased and slow. But I think that the question's a, a good one because, um, you know, there was one of the concerns in the coastal environment is that the dam removal would lead to sort of like an, an ecological catastrophe, essentially, right? That there would be this massive flush of sediment, that the seafloor would get absolutely decimated, and that we'd have this kind of like moonscape is the way people talked about it. And it's just worth noting that we just, we just didn't see that. Um, again, most of our sites didn't have any deposition at all. We had those significant kelp declines during dam removal, but rapid recovery afterwards. And those sites where we did have sediment laid down on the seafloor, they were characterized either by uh, mud, in which case most of the community that lived there before continued to live there and in some cases thrived. So those uh, two worms that I showed you are an example of that, or where we had sand deposition and we had kind of a new community rapidly move in, uh, Dungeness crabs and, and sand lance, for example. Um, so we just didn't see any kind of long-term, um, um, you know, significant ecological consequences, at least that we could find um, at these sites. And so that would suggest to me that um, there's nothing in the, the data that, that I've presented thus far to suggest that it was, that it happened too fast. Um, the system moved the sediment sort of rapidly. Um, and things seem to respond overall fairly well. There's, there's very few kind of negatives that we can point to 
in the coastal environment from dam removal. So that suggests to me that, um, um, well, I guess my conclusion would be, I wouldn't recommend going slower because there's not a huge reason to. Now, yeah. the, that may be a different response if we're thinking about all the sort of consequences up the river as well. Right. Um, I have a question and it kind of relates to the next one that just came up in the chat as well. Um, I remember hearing that historically before the dams were in that the mouth of the Elwha had been an excellent clamming spot for yeah. people um, and the natives that had lived in that area. But looking at that picture that you had of like before dam removal, it looked just like big, huge boulders, not right. like an area where you could do clamming. But I'm wondering now if you have found that it looks more like it did historically and if those clams have removed or have returned. And a, the question in the chat was very similar. It says, yeah, any historical information to know if the shoreline has returned to its original shape or not. So, yeah. Um, so the, the clam question is a really interesting one. And it's one that I got sort of excited about a couple of years ago because there, these stories circulate about people harvesting clams off the beach around the Elwha Delta. And if we could find clear evidence of that, um, that would have told us a lot about historically what the substrate, you know, the beach substrate was like around the Elwha. And that would have been very useful information to have. So I kind of got excited about this and I dove into it a little bit um, and, and found that I could find no um, clearly referenced um, uh, account of people actually harvesting clams off the intertidal beach around the Elwha. So what I could find were well-documented accounts of post-storm harvest, basically uh, clams washing up on the shore after storm events, which is something that happens um, currently. I've seen it occur um, over the sort of 10 or 11 years that I've been working out there. There are lots of bivalves offshore. I didn't show you any bivalve density data, but um, sort of made the case that, that the Elwha is good kelp growing ground. It's also good bivalve growing ground. Um, so there's lots of bivalves just offshore um, that, you know, I totally sort of think that those stories are associated with storm erosion and excavation of those bivalves and tossing them up on shore, where I'm sure people would have, um, you know, enjoyed that sort of bounty uh, when, it, when it happened. So that I could find clearly documented. I still haven't ever found anything that clearly points to, you know, a well-documented story of, of people harvesting shellfish intertidally. Um, and since dam removal has occurred, and we've seen this transition of what used to be a very coarse beach face to something that's probably more amenable to shellfish, shellfish recruitment, we haven't found any intertidal uh, evidence of, or I should say, I've not heard of any um, shellfish um, growth or occurrence intertidally at the, around the Elwha Delta still. Um, so in regards to the shape of the shoreline, our earliest reliable information dates to a coast survey from 1908. And um, the shoreline is not the same as it was in 1908. And I think there's a variety of reasons for that. It is worth noting that um, if you compared 1908, the 1908 shoreline to the 2011 shoreline just before dam removal started, generally the 2011 shoreline was eroded relative to the 1908 shoreline. So chronic erosion characterized this delta prior to dam removal. It's something that we attributed to the dams being in place and cutting off a supply of sediment to the beach. And um, around most of the delta, there are places where the shoreline has um, egraded to or beyond the 1908 shoreline. Uh, so that is cool to see. Um, it's also cool to see the pattern of erosion that characterized this delta be reversed uh, across most of the delta. So uh, the beach has a graded 
associated with dam removal are built out. That's also, I think, the climate change link that, that Woody sort of alluded to in my introduction. One of the things I've become really interested in is using the Elwha dam removal, not to study dam removal, but to study shoreline response to um, basically massive sediment additions. Um, and in the case of Elwha, it came from dam removal, but in other parts of the world, people have done that um, using other methods, either by placing sediment in sort of large amounts. Um, and those sorts of strategies may be very useful in the future as shorelines are put under stress uh, around the world associated with sea level rise. Good point, good point. Um... Another question in the chat is, what is the long-term monitoring plan mm. for this study? And do you anticipate continuing or are there changes coming to your study? Um, that's a, a great question. And I mean, if, I think the short answer is there is none um, in, in the sense of there is no plan. Um, basically the, the post removal era that we are in now, the monitoring associated with that is sort of proceeding how most of the studies proceeded during dam removal, which is where people are sort of making it happen where they can. Um, and so you know, like in my particular case, I'm still uh, monitoring the shoreline. We're still doing these annual dive surveys, although those are getting sort of increasingly difficult year over year. Um, but we're taking it as far as we think we we need to, to be able to assess the things we want to assess. And so um, by way of example, um, the, you know, the question about the shoreline shape, as I've transitioned more into thinking about the Elwha dam removal, not from a dam removal standpoint, but from as a sort of climate change standpoint and as, as a potential adaptation measure, um, that demands that we sort of continue to understand the long-term response of the shoreline. So I've continued to sort of go out to try to um, keep track of where the shoreline is, where it's growing, where it's not growing. So we can paint a picture of sort of the long-term evolution of the shoreline after this big perturbation that occurred, you know, in 2014 or so. Um, other things like maybe kelp's an example of something that, you know, we think we've seen the trajectory of dam removal play out but we're actually continuing to focus on measuring kelp at the Elwha because we're starting to transition towards realizing that we have this wonderful long-term data set um, that comes from a subtitle environment where usually we're not out there measuring. Um, and it tells us something uh, not only about dam removal, but also about these other stressors to the uh, subtitle environment, things like disease, things like climate-driven changes. And so we're trying to keep some of those going back to some of those sites and still counting kelp and invertebrates because we're starting to see other uses for these data. Um, so um, yeah, do you anticipate continuing changes? Yes, but nothing, you know, I, I think we're out of the phase where we expect to see sort of massive changes. You know, one of the thing I guess that I'm, dam removal change that I am very interested in continue to track is whether those sites that went from being cobbly to sandy and had that big change associated with that sort of are slowly eroded through time back into a cobbly uh, habitat. It doesn't appear to be happening rapidly. Right. That's, that's kind of something that, that has um, maintained my interest, I guess, through time. Right on. Okay, we have a couple more just real quick. I know um, a few people have had to yep. go and they have left you messages saying thank you so much and wonderful talk. Um, but Orly, uh, did you, Orly put in notes saying you had a question about uh, salmon. Um, salmon and char. Um, Elwha is most famous for its runs of different species of salmon as well as char. Gary Winans, George Pass, lots of people have done some studies on that. You didn't really address that at all. Right. And I'm just wondering, compared to like the Marmot Dam or, um, well, or the White Salmon Dam, where the salmon seems to have recovered really quickly. And everybody talks about how fast the Elwha is recovering. You know, but at least from Gary's data, the genetics doesn't sort of support 
support that. I'm wondering what you guys saw and what you think uh, for Char as well as Sam. Well, I didn't address it because I do not, we don't ever see salmon, <laughs> oh, okay. you know, at our subtitle sites, um, never, ever once. And so, you know, it's not in our data set. I try to sort of talk to and keep, keep track as well as I can, um, sort of what's happening in the river in regards to salmon. Um, but, you know, neither of my studies, you know, associated with coastal sediments, certainly, and also with, um, you know, these subtitle sites that we survey. Salmon are not a feature in either of those. So, um, you know, I, it's important to note just because everything that I may say about salmon in the Elwha is um, secondhand. And so it sounds like you probably know more than I do. <laughs> but I would note... Oh, I was going to say, it would be really interesting to have somebody who's yes. doing that research come on, because I know you're really focused on the that mouth area, the intertidal yep. area, the effects on the, the the area outside of the river, basically, yeah. versus the research that's being done on the salmon going back up the river. Or right. The habitat. There's even a lot of research being done on like the regrowth of the habitat and... Yep. Yeah. The yeah. And I think river. that, yeah, I think Woody and I sort of had talks about potentially like a, trying to find a follow up speaker that would focus more on what's happening in the river itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have heard some very positive sort of recovery stories from the salmon community in the Elwha, um, but a much slower, you know, recovery trajectory, at least compared to the things that I talked about, right? Um, you know, kelp. And that kind of thing. And I think that makes a ton of sense. Kelp are an annual species. Um, you would expect that recovery would occur very rapidly. Um, you know, whereas one of the key metrics and one of the key things that's being measured in the Elwha Chinook, they have a, you know, four to five year uh, life cycle. So presumably that's going to sort of create a slower recovery trajectory. And that appears to be what's happening. Um, but a lots of lots of positive signs, especially on the juvenile side in terms of juvenile fish coming out of the river. Some of those data are very encouraging. And then some of the eDNA data that, you know, like George Pess is going to be involved in and probably would talk about if George was a, a presenter, where they're using eDNA to try to track where fish are occurring in the river suggests that, um, you know, fish have successfully made it. I think all species that you would expect yes. to move into the upper river have made it into the upper river, not in massive numbers, but enough, you know, enough to shed their DNA and have it picked up using that eDNA method. So um, successful in regards to that habitat being access, uh, accessible to <clears throat> those fish. Um, but I think the numbers recovery game is still very much outstanding. George would be a great speaker. Gary Winans uh, yep. also. Uh, Char, I, I don't know if folks doing the research in Char, but you know, that's a even a better habitat for Char than it is for salmon. So that would be really interesting. But I, I don't, I don't know the people doing that. Yeah, so. I don't know. We we <laughs> certainly try to, um, you know, I I could try to help connect, make connections. That would be great. Especially if there was a particular sort of topic in mind. I, I mean, I know that um, uh, Kevin Long is on the cause with North Olympic Salmon Coalition. He's going to know a lot of those characters as well, probably. So um, excellent. Hopefully, finding the right person. Yeah. Um, so we did have one more question. I thought we could try and do it quickly, and then we'll probably have to say good night for the evening. But um, Sheila wanted uh, just a quick follow up on what types of clams do you or have you heard that were being you know run up onto the beach by these storm driven um currents that were yeah it's a good it's a good question um most of what i've seen when i've seen this occur are butters um and so that you know this person uh oh it's sheila um rep, you know generally a shallower species there's another one that we see um, thanks, Amy. Um, there's another one that we see um, that 
looks like a butter. It's called, we call it Kennerly eye. Um, and I can't remember the genies and species, the genus and species. It's actually very shallow. Um, you know, it buries itself maybe a couple centimeters. Oh, wow. um, and I've never paid attention when I, when I'm seeing this occur on the beach, whether like, um, I have to look close to sort of be like, hey, this is a butter or this is this other species. And I've never looked that closely, but it's, um, you know, it's that size and type of bivalve in general. Now, when we're diving, um, we see lots of horse clam. Um, one of the things that we see at a lot of our sites where horse clam are, um, are, are, are abundant. Um, and it's, those are especially, these are these kind of coarse sites that are to the east of the river mouth um, in maybe 20 to 30 feet of water. Uh, there are horse clams absolutely everywhere. It's, it's astonishing to me actually that so many horse clams can pack themselves into so small an area given how big they are. <laughs> but um, what we see at those sites oftentimes um, are uh, horse clam shells kind of mostly out of the bottom and dead. They're not alive. Um, so just the shell, but perched in a way that just makes me think that the seafloor is eroded away around them. <laughs> and so, um, you know, that makes me think that they must sort of get eroded and washed out sometimes, but I have never seen a, a live one up on the beach. Um, so mostly it seems to be sort of butters. Yeah, I was just kind of curious in terms of how much sediment depth had you know, the deposited over the surface of the substrates where they might have been growing and, you know, the uh, ability of them to extend the siphons, perhaps. Right. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, thank you. I know we need to go. <laughs> yeah, thank you thank so you. much. Else? No, thanks everybody for being here. Wonderful talk. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marvelous. Thanks very much. All right. Sounds good. And uh, I'll just note, I put my email on that last slide. So, oh, I guess you can't see them anymore. I don't know. I'm always happy to nerd out. If <laughs> while, so. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Chrissy. Thanks so much, Ian. I'm going to stop recording. Okay. Um, yeah, December 6th is our next.